So with any kind of sacred text, you're going to need to back it up with a sort of miracle to make that text work for people who esteem a particular version um, with its own divinity or sacredness. Uh, I can remember having a, a Hebrew teacher, and he uh, repeatedly told me that God spoke Hebrew, and uh, he would often regale me with these uh, with these reasons. Uh, and of course, we know that that's not true, but it was just because he had knowledge of Hebrew. But in terms of the text itself, there were a lot of people in Paul's day who considered the Hebrew text to be divine. So when the need arose to have a Greek translation, something was going to have to give. And so the legend is that sometime between the second probably in the in the middle of the second century BC, um, in Alexandria, Egypt, the legend is that 70 rabbis went into 70 isolated rooms with their own copies of the Hebrew text, and that the 70 rabbis all emerged at exactly the same time with 70 translations into the Greek that were absolutely identical. That would be a miracle for if you know two rabbis, you'll know that two rabbis always have three opinions. Uh, and by the way, that is a rabbi joke that a rabbi told me, so I'm in good shape. Um, so you needed some kind of a miracle to give legitimacy to the Greek text. By the time Paul is is kicking, you know, in, in 15 to 20 to 30 uh, CE. That Greek text is well established. And, um, and so Jews in the diaspora, diaspora is a term that is a, usually means to be cast forth. It's a word about sowing seed, and it, it, it describes the Jews who lived outside of Judea after the second exile and who uh, remained in the lands that they had settled. So, of course, they practiced their faith, but in the absence of Hebrew as an everyday language, they fell out of, it fell out of use. And then, of course, um, we see that uh, the Greek text picks up. And it's not the same. It's simply not the same as the Hebrew, and that should go without saying. But even more than that, there are certain translation choices. Paul will use the Greek rather than the Hebrew, and that that can be a little uh, that can be a little difficult to to kind of sort your way through. I don't believe we'll have that problem with you. I mean, you you you'll just take it for granted. But if you ever decide to study the Hebrew and the Greek of the text and try to compare the two, that can become a thorny little problem. So the Jewish Bible expresses a story and a story that also has a theology to it. And it's a story that Paul is extremely devoted to, a story that is not just a nice story, but one that's loaded with theological freight, one that has and claims ultimacy, that is, finality for Paul. And of course, we all know that when you're looking at the Apostle Paul, that he is first known as Saul in the text of Acts of the Apostles. So what I want to do in the minutes that remain, and uh, it'll be probably another 35 to 40 minutes total, 45 minutes, uh, is to walk through these, this story so that we have a broad appreciation for not only the story, but the theology that Paul is trying to convey and that Paul has to deal with when he meets Jesus, uh, probably on that road to Damascus for the first time. Although I always maintain that I think Paul was present at the crucifixion of Jesus. For some reason, I, I think that makes for a really compelling story. Uh, for a really compelling apostle, that he had to have some acquaintance with Jesus in some key way.
So if Paul was there with the physical Jesus at some point in time, he would need a monumental encounter to begin to reformulate how he approached Israel's story. So let's go through that. Uh, you, I'm going to go through a couple of different texts in order to illustrate the kind of story that Paul was devoted to and the kind of story that is in anticipation of what we will see in Paul's letters. So the first text uh, we're going to look at is from Genesis, chapters 1 and 2, with uh, also a nod to Genesis 3 in the fall. That's the fall from grace. Abraham in Genesis 12, um, with a little look at 15 through 17 of Genesis, and then tying Abraham to the land of Judea itself. And then we'll move on from there. So first of all, let's take a look at Genesis. In, uh, in the Genesis text, this is the story that Paul is well aware of, well aware of. So in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God, literally a spirit of God, swept over the face of the waters. That's actually one of the most, one of the greatest words um, in scripture and the New Revised Standard translated as a wind of God. And I guess technically it's not wrong, but the Ruach of God, the Spirit of God, swept over the face of the waters. I always like to get that. I know that that's playing my hand a little bit to Trinitarian theology, but it also expresses what the Hebrew Scriptures know too, and that is God is known in different ways to and through creation. So here we have seven days of creation with God creating environments and then populating them, those environments, with creatures that God speaks into existence. So there's nothing before God. God is all and all. And of course, humanity is the apex to creation in verses 26 through 28. God said, let us make human humanity in our own image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals. And so God created humankind in God's image, and the image of God created them, male and female. God created them, and God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So you see here that God is, is putting humanity in a pride of place. Humanity is the apex of creation in chapter 1 and the beginning of the creation story in Genesis 2. And that's an interesting little development that you have the first creation story told in a rather formulaic way, and the six days followed by the day of rest, and God saw that it was good. So Paul, Paul has the notion that not only has God created all of the universe, all of reality, that God sustains it and that God provides for it so within God's providential care, um, but that humanity is in some ways the apex of God's creation and that humanity bears the image of God in some way. How I come to that passage of Scripture and how I interpret that passage of Scripture now probably doesn't match the way Paul uh, thought of it. I, I puzzle over that because to me, to be created in the image of God, my translation or my interpretation is that God creates us for community one with the other. And there have been different images floated, uh, different ways in which the image of God impressed on humanity takes its course. But uh, I'm not sure how Paul would have taken this. It is possible that um, in terms of the image of God and humanity, male and female, and the community that's involved there could be Paul's understanding. Um, we have to, I think it's responsible just to put a question mark on that. Um, I do think that Paul thought the definitive image of God in the created world ended up being Jesus, God's son. That did happen, but that happens later. For now, though, as we try to talk about the background for Paul, his background in the Hebrew scriptures gives him a sense of God's creative power, God's almighty, holy power, 
to to give creation its uh, reality. No sooner has God created the world, and we speed through this rather intimate description of creation in Genesis 2 with Adam and with Eve, then we find we have uh, what I consider to be the watershed moment of Scripture, both Jewish Scripture as, as well as Christian, and that is the fall from grace. The fall from grace, it is, the fall is not this, you know, uh, whimsically, I'll say something about how, you know, not this is not pumpkin spice and cinnamon apple. This is the fall from grace. God issues a command to the male and the female, uh, and God says you can eat of any tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for the day you eat of that tree, you shall die. Uh, obviously, they don't die immediately, and you know the rest of the story. The uh, the serpent tempts Eve. She eats the fruit and then hands it to Adam. He eats. And of course, the text says they are naked and ashamed and hide. God comes and discovers what they have done. I've often wondered, because God has to go find them, God cannot see them. I often wondered if our own sin and, and uh, failing, our own rebellion against the grace of God does put us in sort of a perilous place where not even God can see us in our open rebellion. I'm not sure how I feel about that, but what a harrowing thought that is. But when God finds the man and the woman, notice that the first thing that they do is they, uh, they, get, some, they get some clothing on, and uh, God actually gives them some things to make clothing out of. And if you and I were God, you'd probably give them poison ivy leaves, right? But God is gracious. Um, and I think that's interesting because the result of sin, sin is the is break is sin is doing something, or or sin is trusting oneself instead of trusting God. God said, "Don't eat of that tree." Humanity eats of that tree anyway, trusts itself rather than God. You'll find that that definition holds up pretty well throughout Scripture and finds its Pauline correspondent in Romans 14.23, where Paul says that anything that does not proceed from faith is sin. So it's a negative definition of sin. And I like that because it preserves the relational characteristic. Uh, sin is a fracture in the relationship. Notice that the fracture in the relationship works on the horizontal and the vertical levels. On the vertical level, it's a fracture in our relationship with God when we failed to trust. So that's the, hor the vertical dimension, or the vertical dimension, a fracture with our relationship with God. And then the horizontal dimension is when we have sacrificed and have broken the relationship we have with our fellow uh, travelers, our fellow human beings. And so um, Adam and Eve that had uh, enjoyed an intimate relationship that even clothing was not uh, a part of the deal, found themselves with a barrier immediately, and that is their own shame. And they construct the clothing that is indicative of this new reality that they have to make their way in. So the fall from grace. Now the question here is determinative. And let me frame it to you this way, because many people look at Jewish and Christian scripture from this point of view. What will humanity have to do to put their relationship with God back into the right, right standing? I'd like to suggest that the question should be reversed, and that is, now that humanity has, has demonstrated its failure, what will God do to put the relationship back to rights? And I think that is precisely the right kind of question. What will God do? to put humanity back into right relationship with God, God's self. And that's where Paul sees Jesus, and that's where Paul sees a solution. But to me, the rest of Scripture follows from Genesis chapter 3. So Genesis chapter 3 is the fall from grace. Now we're going to take a little break, and when we come back, we're going to look at what that means as we go forward. <music> 